that indians are joining ma'am yes are we good to go now uh give one minute 630 to 630 all right You can start now. All right. So I request the attention of the faculties and delegates. I will take a few minutes of yours and let me introduce me and the faculty members of the session. So good evening and welcome to one and all. I'm Ankita from Planet, the science session assistant for a seamless experience. And Planet is India's most trusted and widely used tech platform with multiple enriching services exclusively for doctors. Planet is very proud to be a digital partner for this event organized by a Society of Onco Anesthesia and Perioperative Care. And topic of today's session is Anastasia for Colorectal Onco Surgery Lecture Series 22. Let's begin today's session, for which I would like to invite Dr. Joshna Ma'am to take over. Over to you, Ma'am. Kindly proceed with you. Uh, thank you, Ankita. Good evening, all. Uh, I, today, we are going to start the 22nd uh, session of uh, SOPC webinar lecture series. And uh, today's topic is Anastasia for Colorectal Surgery which I think all of us uh, are practicing almost in daily basis. So I expect every one of all the delegates to uh, actually participate uh, very actively and take part because a lot of uh, confusion, a lot of uh, things to know and discuss in collateral surgery. So I expect everyone take part actively and discuss with, the, uh, with the, our speaker and our chairperson uh, actively. So it will be a nice experience sort of together. And today's session, uh, the chairperson, I invite the chairperson today, Dr. Arvind Narayanan. And he has, uh, he is presently working in Chen Adhyar Hathwa, Chennai as associate professor and senior consultant in Onco Anesthesia, the Department of Anesthesia, Pain and Palliative Care. And he has got a great uh, academic career. Uh, he has done multiple degrees from different places. And also he has got a lot of experience for many years hospitals. And last two years, he's attached to the uh, Adhir Hospital Chennai. So I'll invite Dr. Arvind to, and his main uh, special area of interest, I must say that onco anesthesia and pediatric anesthesia, neonatal anesthesia, trauma anesthesia, and also medical education, quality and healthcare accreditation. So I invite Dr. Arvind to chair through this session. Thank you, madam. Very good evening to everybody. And we convey our uh, regards from Chennai. I hope I'm audible to everybody. Yes, yes, you are audible. Yeah, very good evening. Uh, it, it's as madam has pointed out, it's a, it's a very uh, important topic that we are discussing today. And uh, to do this, to take us through the nuances and the entire gamut of anesthetic challenges for colorectal uh, surgeries. We have Dr. Nairita Das. She's my colleague at the Adyar Cancer Institute. And she's a consultant anesthesiologist who's had quite a bit of experience in the same institute. And prior to that, she has uh, worked in Manipal. And uh, she brings a wealth of expertise from big institutions. And I'm sure she will take us through all the finer aspects of this particular topic. So Dr. Nairita, welcome. And uh, I would like you to start off with no further delay. I'll currently share my screen. Good evening, everyone. Uh, so we, yes, we are going to go on a very important topic today, which is anesthesia for colorectal oncosurgeries. So first, let's see what we have ahead of us. So we're going to look a little bit on the epidemiology and treatment of colorectal cancers. Then we are going to look at the perioperative management of these colorectal oncosurgeries with special focus on ERAS and pain management. We are going to discuss certain salient features of minimally invasive endoscopic and HIPEC and PIPAC surgeries. 
After this, we're going to have a look at a patient coming for an emergency colorectal cancer surgery. And finally, we'll touch a little bit upon anesthesia and recurrence in colorectal cancers. Globocan 2020 has told us that colorectal cancers are the third most common cancers in the world and the second leading cause of death due to cancer. If you look at the projections which are uh, posted for 2040, the incidence of cancers uh, from the colon and rectum is only going to increase exponentially. In India, it's going to almost double by 2040. A look at the risk factors and symptoms tells us the kind of patients we expect to see at our PAC clinic. These patients are going to be old, obese, diabetic, or smokers. They're going to be fairly deconditioned and having poor lifestyles. They're also going to be anemic and have severe weight loss and thus be cachexic. This diagram tells us about the different stages of colorectal cancer and we'll discuss its treatment. So for colon cancer, it's usually upfront surgery. In stage zero, one, and two, where the uh, tumor is confined to the wall of the uh, colon or rectum the, uh, of colon, the treatment is usually by surgery followed by lymph node dissection. Whereas in stage three, where it goes into the lymph nodes, surgery will be followed by adjuvant chemotherapy. In stage four, where there are distant metastases, if it's a limited meds, they are undergo upfront surgery followed by uh, adjuvant chemotherapy, or if it's widespread meds, they may undergo NACT followed by surgery and then again adjuvant chemotherapy. For rectal cancers, the idea is usually to shrink the tumor as much as possible so as to achieve a sphincter sparing surgery. So these patients undergo NACT or RT followed by surgery. I wanted to know a little bit more about these, uh, about the surgical aspects of these cancers. And so I asked a surgical colleague of mine, and this is what she scribbled to me on the back of a glove paper. So apparently a lot depends upon whether the initial presentation of the patient is in obstruction or not. If not in obstruction, we proceed as was told earlier. But if the patient is in obstruction, it changes our management a bit. So if there are no nodes, if there are or, or limited uh, or no liver metastasis, we undergo a primary surgery and this may be associated with a stoma or stenting. If the liver mets are resectable, then a liver mets resection may be accompanied by a primary surgery even if the patient is obstructed. Whereas if there, are there is an unresectable tumor along with widespread mets, then the patient undergoes a primary stoma for the surgery, followed by new adjuvant chemotherapy and comes back for the primary surgery. So a stent supposedly avoids two surgeries in the face of obstruction. Also, she told me something very important about the return of intended oncological therapy, which should be less than eight weeks for colorectal cancer. And if it's more than 11 weeks, it affects the survival of cancer. The different surgeries for colon cancer are the various types of colectomies that we know being left, right, subtotal, or total colectomies. For rectal cancers, the surgery depends on the location of the tumor and the margin that we want to give. So for uh, um, tumors of the rectosigmoid or upper one third of the rectum, what is done is a is an anterior resection. In this surgery, patients are usually supine and there is no stoma at the end of it. Unless, uh, I mean, they may be prone if a circular stapler needs to be put. In for the middle one third of the rectum, usually we go for a low anterior resection, LAR or an ULAR, in which also the patient is in lithotomy and these patients end up with a temporary stoma. Um, for the lower rectal cancers, lower one third, we go for an abdominoperineal resection, which involves a permanent stoma. Then there is the ELIP, which is extra levator ex abdominoperitoneal excision, with, in which the patient first undergoes a tumor um, excision by APR in the supine position, and then is turned prone in a jackknife position to do the perineal flap 
and again place supine for a stoma. Something similar to doing chapatis by hand, according to my dear colleagues. Um, also, there's a pelvic accentuation, which is done for more extensive uh, tumors involving other organs like the bladder or the uterus. Diversion stomas are done for obstructions. Liver metastatectomies may be done during the first upfront surgery if it is a confined small met. Hypex are done for PCI less than 15. And a new procedure called PIPAC is done for more extensive uh, tumors which are not amenable for Hypex. So if this patient comes to the pre-anesthetic clinic to me, I'm going to do a directed history, physical examination, and investigations to assess three main things, anemia, malnutrition, and the degree of deconditioning of these patients. Also, I'm going to look at the metastasis, which may be to the liver, lung, or the peritoneum, or also anywhere else in the body. I'm going to look for features of obstruction, like dehydration and electrolyte disturbances. I'm going to look for effects of chemo and pelvic uh, chemotherapy and pelvic radiotherapy. Stomas may land, especially ileostomies, may land up the patient in dehydration. Also, like any other patient, they may have cardiovascular or respiratory disease, and they may be obese. A conglomeration of all this helps us to assess the functional capacity of the patient. This can done, be done by something as simple as the metabolic equivalence or something more objective like the Duke Activity Status Index. Of course, CPET is the gold standard, but it's not yet um, recommended routinely for these surgeries. Now, there is something simple called the um, field walk tests, all the increment or the incremental shuttle walk tests. So these have been shown. So an incremental shuttle walk test of less than 250 meters has been shown to be a reliable predictor of postoperative morbidity, morbidity in these patients undergoing colorectal oncosurgery. It's equivalent to apparently 14.1 ml per kg of ml per kg per minute of VO2 max. Also, I'm going to look at the effects of chemotherapy from 5-fluorouracil, irinotecan, capacitabin, and oxaliplatin, namely the effects on the coronary circulation or neutropenia or um, the, system, the effects of, uh, on the peripheral nervous system. There's something called pelvic radiation disease, which has an effect uh, on anesthesia in the sense that it causes uh, uh, chronic pelvic pain, the vascular become the vasculature becomes very friable in these patients and also they may have lumbar plexopathy and skin changes which makes positioning a challenge so before we move on let me tell you a story so uh, the punching time at our hospital is 8 30 a.m and i got into this very bad habit of punching just a little bit late 8 35 40, 45, pushing it to 50. I would blame my harmless little daughter for that or the mad traffic in Chennai. So one fine day, I decided to do something about it. I started to make small changes in my daily routine to help me. I packed my bags the night before. I got different alarms set, not only to get, early, get up earlier in the morning, but also for various things including when I should leave the house. I also kept a journal to tell me when uh, I've been punching e in each day. The results were almost immediate. I had free roads to work every day. I was able to punch in on time, which felt like an achievement in itself. Also, I had a stress-free start of the day and I did not really do an audit of the anesthetic outcomes, but I'm sure it was much better. So this brings me to the concept of aggregation of marginal gains. Small improvements in various fields done over a long period of time can lead to phenomenal results. And I think this forms the backbone of what we call enhanced recovery after surgery. Why am I concentrating so much on ERAS in my talk? It's because 
it's in colorectal surgeries that first ERAS came up and it's uh, gone all for all this gone on to all the surgeries uh, that you can imagine. So now we are in the fourth update of ERAS for colorectal cancers for colorectal surgeries. So this will be one uh, paper that I'll be looking at. Also, I'll be looking at guidelines by the American Society of Colon and Rectal Surgeons. All through the way, I'm going to try to answer three questions. First, what is the rationale behind the recommendation? Secondly, what is the recommendation and the level of evidence we have currently? And what should I be doing finally? So we do know the different grades of recommendation based on a group of panelists, which is strong, weak, and no recommendation at all, which is one, two, et cetera. And the level of evidence, which is A, B, C, or high, moderate, and low, depending on the weight and the uh, evidence that we have for a particular recommendation. I'm going to divide this into pre-admission, pre-operative, intraoperative, and post-operative phases. A job well begun is said to be half done. So there are certain aspects in the pre-admission management which help us get better outcomes. Those of you who have little daughters, I'm sure know about Elsa's fear of the unknown. Similarly, these patients with colorectal cancers have huge fears, fear of the surgery, of the anesthetic, of the pain thereafter, of the outcomes, of recurrence, they have so many questions. And a simple pre-admission information, education and counseling has a way to show that it improves the preparedness of the patient for surgery and also improves the length of stay and post-operative outcomes. These patients should also be sent to a stoma clinic where they will receive proper counseling about stoma how to handle it, manage it, manage dehydration, et cetera. In fact, an ileostomy pathway which has been put in place has in a, in a particular study showed that it improved, I mean, in fact, reduced the readmission due to, um, due to dehydration from 15% to almost 0%. Next, we try to assess the risk. There are several risk assessment tools like the CR POSM, and the ACPGBI, which is the Great Britain uh, colorectal cancer model to assess the risk of these patients for surgery. The, their use, the level of evidence for their use is still moderate. It seems intuitive to optimize their comorbidities like hypertension, diabetes, pulmonary disease, et cetera, to achieve outcomes, though the evidence is not great yet. Elderly patients form a big chunk of this population, and these patients are at a higher risk for falls, post-operative delirium, and post-operative cognitive decline. And these issues need to be addressed and picked up preoperatively. Smoking cessation is a must. Smoking cessation for four weeks prior to surgery has been shown to improve post-operative outcomes, including wound healing, and respiratory complications. So it's strongly advised. It's a grade 1A recommendation. Also, alcohol abstinence has been shown to decrease the risk of post-operative wound complications by quite a bit, and it's a 1B recommendation again. Next, coming to our favorite topic, prehabilitation. So prehabilitation is, an, is, a, is a way to improve the baseline of the patients. There is this golden period between the diagnosis of cancer and definitive treatment, either NACT or so, and proceeding to surgery, which, is, which can be used to improve the patient nutritionally, to improve their deconditioned status and also their psychological status. A, a meta-analysis of 35 studies with 3,400 patients has shown that patients undergoing uh, prehabilitation for major abdominal surgeries have lower rates of overall pulmonary and cardiac complications. So though earlier the recommendation was 2B, probably this will change in the next update. 
There are some questions which come to our mind when it comes to prehabilitation. Should I be using unimodal or multimodal technique? So as we said that the problems are multi, uh, multi-pronged in these patients, I think we should be using a multimodal technique. Is a supervised prehabilitation better or a home-based one? So the patients actually prefer a home-based technique. So an initial supervised followed by home-based technique would be ideal. How should I ensure compliance of my patient? So probably a video platform like this where I can watch my patient do exercise or watch what they're, uh, what they're consuming as part of their diet would be good. When should prehabilitation be started? ASAP, as soon as possible. Whether they're going to undergo surgery first or going for NACT, we should be starting prehabilitation as soon as possible. It's also been shown to improve their uh, condition during uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy and radiotherapy. Next comes preoperative nutritional care. So poor preoperative nutrition status has been associated with morbidity, mortality, and poor oncological outcomes. There are several screening tools which are available, as we know, like the SGA, the NRS, and the MUST. And these can be utilized to assess the degree of malnutrition of these patients. Serum albumin has been shown to be an independent risk factor for postoperative morbidity and mortality. So when a patient with a BMI less than 18.5 and unplanned weight loss of less than 10% or a decrease of more than 50% in their intake, along with a low albumin comes to me, I would put him in a, in a category of severely malnourished status and start oral nutritional supplementation for at least seven to 10 days, even at the cost of delaying the surgery a bit. The stress is on the protein and a protein of 1.2 to 1.5 grams per kg per day has been recommended and it improves the rates of wound infection and anastomotic leaks. If the patient can't take orally and achieve even a 60% of their requirement, then parenteral nutrition should be, recommend, should be in, uh, put in place. Immunonutrition still remains controversial and further studies are required for us to be able to recommend it in ERAS. Now, talking about anemia. So anemia is the most common extraintestinal symptom in uh, colorectal cancer patients. So what kind of anemia do these people have? It's mostly due to an iron deficiency anemia. And this is both an absolute as well as an, a functional deficiency. So why should I treat it? It's because it's an independent risk factor for postoperative outcomes, length of stay, and 30-day mortality and morbidity. Should I be giving oral or IV iron? So oral iron doesn't really work. As I said earlier, these patients have what is called a functional iron deficiency. So this means that the inflammatory markers that are released, they upregulate the hepcidin pathway in these patients. And this decreases the absorption of iron from the gastrointestinal tract also, it decreases the incorporation of iron into erythroid precursors. So, an IV iron therapy is ideal because it, circumvent, it circumvents this route and causes a good erythropoietic response. Ferric, ferric carboxymaltose, a single dose of one gram, two to four weeks prior, is recommended. Also, there's a strong recommendation against blood transfusion in colorectal cancer surgeries. So this meta-analysis of almost a lakh and 75,000 patients showed that perioperative transfusions causes a dramatic ne negative effect on long-term prognosis, and that is overall survival. And also in more recent studies been shown about re recurrence in colorectal cancer, and also it increases short-term complications like the anastomotic complications, general, pulmonary, cardiac complications. And hence, we should be avoiding blood transfusions to the extent possible. 
So with all this in mind, we have revamped our PAC chart a little bit, including advice regarding high protein diet, uh, about anemia correction, activity and smoking cessation. Also, we are trying to assess their nutritional status, frailty index, etc. We still have to audit this, but I'm sure it will be a positive audit. Failing to prepare is probably preparing to fail. So what am I going to do preoperatively after the patient is admitted to help me better my outcomes? The one question which is in everybody's mind is mechanical bowel preparation. Even the surgeons were forever confused what to do, whether to do it or not, whether they should be doing with oral antibiotics or IV antibiotics. So now finally, they have come to the conclusion that mechanical bowel preparation with oral antibiotics is useful. In fact, what is recommended is an SSI prevention bundle, which is, uh, and in this meta-analysis, it has been shown to decrease the SSI rates by more than 40%. So there is this mechanical bowel preparation with oral antibiotics uh, before surgery, an IV antibiotic prophylaxis of, uh, with cephalosporin and metrodotazone prior to incision, and also observing the routine um, aseptic precautions during surgery. What this also means for us as anesthetists is that these patients are going to be quiet fluid depleted maybe up to one to two liters of fluid depletion may be there. So what should we be doing? We should try to keep them euvalinic. So for this, we want to be giving them uh, clear fluids up to two hours before surgery. And this is a 1A grade of recommendation. Also, if IV fluids are required over and above this to correct dehydration, it should be started. What about carbohydrate load? Carbohydrate loading has been shown to decrease the stress response, increase uh, insulin sensitivity, and to protect against uh, protein breakdown, as well as decrease myocardial injury. The evidence is not yet strong for this, and it's still to be. If we do it, what would we do? We'll give 12.5% of a complex carbohydrate, like maltodextrin, 800 ml on the night prior and 400 ml two to three hours prior to surgery. It should be avoided, however, in patients with delayed gastric emptying and those coming with for emergency surgeries. In diabetics and in obese patients, the evidence is not yet strong and cannot be routinely recommended. In spite of everything that we do, often these patients land up like this in the operation theater. So in those times, a little bit of it's going to be okay and a smile and a holding hand works as a beautiful verbal anxiolite. ERAS recommends against routine sedative premedication and also strongly recommends against using benzodiazepines, especially in the elderly. So I'm sure you all know about the A, B and chair of anesthesia. This is how I want to be sitting during my anesthetic. By the way, that's not me, but this is how I want to be sitting in the operation theater during my anesthetic. And for that, I want to be giving a good anesthetic. So what's a good or standard anesthetic according to ERAS? So it is the use of short acting anesthetics like fentanyl, sevoflurane, desflurane. It is opioid spiring, even if it's still, if if it yet cannot be opioid free. Timur is not routinely recommended for these patients. It's only recommended in patients for a high risk of POND. Nitrous oxide is preferably avoided because it delays the bowel return as well as causes post-operative nausea vomit. Recently, it's also been strongly recommended to use cerebral monitoring in the form of say BIS and to keep it within 40 to 60 probably to optimize the amount of anesthesia that we give and to enable fast return from uh, recovery from anesthesia. A deep neuromuscular blockade, however, is not recommended because it increases the risks of post-operative pulmonary complications. And also it's strongly recommended to monitor objectively the reversal of neuromuscular blockade 
with a trough ratio confirmed to be more than 90 percent. Of course, we should also be looking on the other side because as we know, the uh, methods and degree of communication by, or by our dear surgeons is highly varied. Next, coming to fluid. Everything in life is about a balance, isn't it? And so is fluid. We knew for quite some time that giving too much of fluid is bad. It leads to uh, problems of fluid overload and has been shown to give poorer outcomes. Recently, we have also understood that the other extreme, that is giving too little fluid, is not too good. We have discussed a lot about this relief trial on this platform, and it's been shown that a restrictive fluid strategy is probably not too good in these patients because it increases the risk of, uh, renal, uh, of uh, AKI and renal replacement therapy. So probably what we should be doing is a slightly positive, say a positive of, of about one liter at the end of surgery, but not exceeding more than 2.5 to three liters at the end of surgery. A, a balanced salt solution of crystalloids should be used both for maintenance and bolus. What about no, normal saline? Normal saline is a big no-no because it causes hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis and increases the risk of uh, AKI. Also, colloids are not really recommended and haven't been found to be overtly useful over crystalloids. It can be used in certain situations where there is acute blood loss or severe dehydration. We should be avoiding even short episodes of hypotension. Gold directed fluid therapy, which was earlier recommended, is now recommended only for high risk or complicated surgeries. And of course, we should be trying to discontinue IV fluids as much as possible. And remember that fluid is also a drug. We know about the deleterious effects of hypothermia on the cardiovascular system, on the coagulation system, as well as delaying the drug metabolism. It also has an effect on the splanchnic blood flow by causing vasoconstriction and hence making the colon and rectum more prone for ischemia. What about laparoscopic surgeries? Contrary to earlier belief, even laparoscopic uh, surgery patients can end up in hypothermia. And that's because they, uh, do insufflate cold and dry carbon dioxide. And because of this, it's, it's a grade 1A recommendation to actively warm these patients with hot air blankets, uh, give them warm fluids, maintain the ambient room temperature uh, more than 21 degrees, and also a degree of pre-warming will be helpful in these patients. Post-operative nausea vomiting is probably one of the most distressful uh, symptoms of GI surgeries, and also it leads to great patient dissatisfaction. It also leads to dehydration, uh, delay in resumption of orals, and prolongs the length of stay. Apart from the APFIL score, the GI surgery per se is a risk factor for POMD, and we can prevent this by minimizing fasting, using an opioid sparing technique, avoiding nitrous oxide, and using total intravenous anesthesia in high-risk patients. And hence, we should be doing a multimodal form of POMV prophylaxis. So even in patients who have low risk of POMV, we should be giving them two agents, that is a 5-HT3 antagonist, as well as a steroid. Other intraoperative measures like using the minimally invasive approach has been shown to reduce overall complications and length of stay. And wherever the expertise is available, we should be doing minimally invasive approach. Currently in our hospital, 48% of the patients undergoing colorectal curative surgeries undergo a minimally invasive approach. No routine NG tubes and abdominal drains are recommended and normoglycemia is the rule. What are the post-operative in interventions that we can do to enhance recovery in these patients? They should be mobilized early and progressively 
and made to walk within 24 hours of their surgery. Also, early feeding, that is presumption of feeding within 24 hours of surgery it has been shown to be the single most uh, factor to avoid post-operative ileus. Interestingly, chewing gum stimulates the vagus uh, nerve and also increases salivary production and it has been shown to decrease the incidence of ileus. Albimopan is a peripherally acting opioid antagonist and it, it counteracts the effects, peripheral effects of opioids on ileus. And this has also got a 1B recommendation. Early urinary catheter removal is recommended because it decreases risks of UTI. Also, DVT prophylaxis is a must. We should be using mechanical prophylaxis as well as an extended pharmacological prophylaxis up to 28 days in these malignancy patients. You can't really have a surgery without post-operative complications, can you? In this study, which is a, uh, published in JAMA, they have, shown, uh, they have looked at the associations of specific post-operative complications on outcomes and found that though ileus is the most common complication, it is the anastomotic leaks that have the largest overall effect on 30-day clinical and economic outcomes after colon resection. So let's look at little bit on the, about the physiology of the colon and its blood flow. So we know that the colonic and rectal blood flow comes from the uh, mesenteric arteries and the rectal arteries. There are a few watershed areas in the intestine which are more prone for ischemia. For example, the splenic flexure of the colon or the rectosigmoid junction. The rectum per se is, a, is an area of quite variable blood supply. The, these, uh, the intestine also has high metabolic demands. Then there's a very interesting countercurrent mechanism which goes on between the arterioles and venules of a villus. So if you see that the PO2 in this reduces from the base to the tip and it drops to less than 10 at the top. So the luminal areas of the colon are more subjected to ischemia. There's also a beautiful gut microbiome which maintains homeostasis in the gut. Now this diagram shows us uh, the risk factors for anastomotic leakage. And if you see here, there are several elements of ERAS like smoking, managing anemia, correcting diabetes, and optimal uh, fluid therapy in TROP, avoiding hypothermia, avoiding uh, transfusions, which decrease the risk for anastomotic leaks. Also, maintaining a saturation more than 93% and an FiO2 more than 0.3 has been shown to decrease the risk of anastomotic leakage. What about vasopressors? A prolonged and high dose of vasopressor is implicated in anastomotic leaks but a low to moderate vasopressors usage after correcting fluid deficit in order to maintain a map between 10 to 20% of the baseline is recommended. NSAIDs were forever implicated in causing intestinal anastomosis, uh, in, co in causing intestinal anastomotic leaks. And now it's been shown in this study, which is a meta-analysis, that they do not increase the risk of anastomotic leaks. Next, we come to the all important management of pain in these colorectal surgeries. So pain is multi-pronged these, in these patients. It can be a somatic pain, visceral pain, inflammatory pain, neuropathic pain, or shoulder tip pain from the diaphragmatic irritation. And hence, it's obvious that we should be using a multimodal technique. Pain after colorectal surgeries is quite severe. In this study, it's shown that more than 50% of patients have an NRS of four or more on the first three days after surgery. Also, interestingly, more patients have pain in the first, I mean, on the POD zero of a minimally invasive group. And in them, on subsequent days, the pain is lesser. 
Also, if you look at the chronic post-surgical pain after colorectal surgeries, about one third of the patients at three months and one fifth of the patients after six months end up with chronic pain. And the risk factors of that are young age, presence of preoperative abdominal pain, long duration of surgery, and pain on movement within 24 hours of surgery. And hence we need to hit this pain hard on its head. So the three golden rules of pain management in these surgeries will be multimodal, opioid sparing to avoid the problems of ileus, post-operative nausea, vomiting, and delayed recovery. And it should be started preemptively and continued in the post-operative period. So in open colorectal surgeries, it's quite simple. Thoracic epidural is supposed to be the gold standard and is a 1A recommendation. Along with this, paracetamol and NSAIDs are useful in our multimodal approach. But what if you can't put an epidural? And this is where the prospect guidelines guide us. So you could use all these other things like facial plane blocks, including the tab block and the quadratus lumborum block. Also, IV lignocaine has been shown to decrease the post-operative opio opioid uh, requirements, and it's a 1A recommendation. Ketamine and magnesium are useful adjuvants. Opioids, systemically, should be used only as a rescue technique. In minimally invasive surgeries, the pain is quite well managed by a small dose of long-acting opioid like morphine administered intrathecally. And we have started using this for all our robotic and laparoscopic LARs, APRs, etc. We restrict the dose to less than 300 to avoid the side effects. A thoracic epidural is probably an overkill in these cases. Lignocaine infusion, the uh, facial nerve blocks, and wound infiltration have also been found to be useful in this study to uh, counteract this pain. Next, we'll come to minimally invasive surgeries for colorectal cancers. We already know the benefits of it, but what are our concerns as anesthetists? As you can see, the head here is on the floor and the legs are up in the sky. And we can imagine the degree of respiratory embarrassment that this set of lungs is going to have. And hence, we have to be careful about the high airway pressures and its effects. Also, it's been shown that splanchnic blood flow is quite affected and by high intra-abdominal pressures, and this can lead to uh, ischemia reperfusion injuries. Also, there can be edema of the face, eyes, airway, as well as cerebral edema, and hence, in these cases, a restrictive fluid strategy is advised. As you can see, the positioning is not just Trendelenburg. There's also an added lithotomy to this. So this makes the patient susceptible for compartment syndrome in the legs as well as in the uh, gluteal areas. Also, there's a stretch, stretch of the femoral nerve and other lower limb nerves which can cause neuropathy at a later stage. Should I be using a deep neuromuscular blockage is the question. So there's, there are studies to show that a deep blockage has been, uh, has let us come down on the intra-abdominal pressures from 15 to eight millimeters mercury. But let me ask you, which surgeon is going to come down on the pressures, even if you give him a deep neuromuscular blockage? I don't think anyone. On the other hand, the risks of a deep neuromuscular blockade is quite high, like it causes post-operative pulmonary complications. So according to ERAS, they recommend moderate neuromuscular blockade, and this is enough. We should be also avoiding nitrous oxide in this case, because not only, as we said about post-operative nausea vomiting, it also increases the bowel dis distension which is uh, quite a problem for the surgeons. So this is how I feel when I have to give anesthesia for 
endoscopic colonic procedures or any endoscopic procedure. There's a place for everybody in the room, the surgeon, the endoscopist, the nurses, the x-ray technician, as well as the company person who's selling his tent. And I am usually having to fight for my head end. If it's a simple uh, diagnostic colonoscopy or a uh, submucosal dissection, it's okay. But if the patient comes for colonic stenting, we know that they are going to be older, sicker, of a higher ASAPS class and also obstructive. They are going to be at higher risks for pulmonary aspiration. And in this case, I wouldn't give sedation. I'll go ahead with GA with an RSI technique. Also, these procedures are prone for a risk of uh, pneumoperitoneum and perforation. So I'll have to be even more careful. And the length, we don't know how long the person, the uh, endoscopist is going to try to uh, place this tent. The drugs used are variable and each anesthetist has their own level of comfort with different drugs. So this is probably a surgery in which I would not sit. Now let's look at this patient. He's a 66 year old, stage four colon cancer on palliative chemotherapy. He has not passed tools for one week and his CECT shows that his bowels are dilated, and he's having lung and liver meds and ascites. Also, by the way, his albumin is 2.8. And when we did an ABG, it showed a mixed picture of respiratory and metabolic acidosis. So what are going to be my main concerns in this patient with an obstructed bowel? So first thing is, what is his hemodynamic status? How much fluid depleted is he? So apart from the clinical parameters like heart rate, blood pressure, feeling of the pulse, etc., we also can do a bedside echo to give us an idea about the IVC as well as look at the cardiac contractility because I know he's undergoing a chemo right now. Also, I'm, I can do a simple ABG to know the level uh, of acidosis that he has and to look at the electrolyte disturbances. Obviously, I'll be doing a rapid sequence induction in him because of that large abdominal distension. Also, I'm going to look for features of sepsis or probably coagulopathy. It, he might be in perforation too. So all these things should be running through my mind. Also, because he has an advanced disease, how does that affect my anesthetic technique, like the presence of liver or lung meds. So all these have been addressed in the NELA um, emergency laparotomy project. And the three recommendations which they make is early antibiotics, goal-directed fluid therapy, and post-operative intensive care. About HIPEC, we know uh, that these uh, surgeries have a lot of fluid shifts and blood loss in them. Temperature goes haywire and toxicity of the chemotherapeutic agents has also to be addressed. I'm sure there'll be more detailed lectures on HIPEC and we'll look at them there. There's something new called PIPAC, which is a pressurized intraperitoneal aerosolized chemotherapy. And this, this is used in advanced uh, peritoneal cancers where uh, the patient is not amenable for HIPAC. Through a laparoscopic technique under pressure, something like a DO spray, the chemotherapeutic agent is injected into the abdomen and supposedly it works better than the HIPAC for, and, uh, for uh, intraperitoneal meds. Um, the anesthetic concerns are not something too much to handle. They are, it's just like a routine laparoscopy. So the main concern would be the environmental pollution by chemotherapeutic agents. There have to be proper standards placed for that. So the final thing, recurrence and anesthesia. So we all know why we women need husbands, don't we? We can't really blame them, blame God for everything, isn't it? So now, um, what about anesthesia and recurrence in colorectal cancer. The evidence suggests that there's only a weak association between inhalational agents and recurrence and no association for all-cause mortality and disease-free survival. 
This is from a large retrospective registry-based study uh, from Denmark at, in which four, nearly 4,000 propensity matched patients were there in each group. Also, it's shown that epidural analgesia was not statistically significantly associated with less cancer recurrence. So for now, we can continue doing what we are doing and uh, we should wait for further evidence. This ends my lecture. And what are the take home points that I would want to present? So first of all, the overall burden of colorectal cancer is increasing. The concept of aggregation of marginal gains as illustrated by ERAS is what is, uh, we should be following. Pain management is essential in these patients. These patients also come for varied procedures with varied anesthetic concerns. And currently, there is no evidence to suggest that anesthetics are instrumental in recurrence of colorectal cancer. So I finally leave you with this note, which says that making a choice that is 1% better or 1% worse may be insignificant in this moment, but over a span of moments that make up a lifetime, these choices determine the difference between who you are and who you could be by James Clear in his book, Atomic Habits. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nairita. Thank you. Sir. I think uh, she has quoted James Clear and has made her intentions very clear that she, she would like to understand, all of us to understand very clearly what are the imperative mechanisms of management of colorectal surgery in the cancer population. And she has taken us to the entire gamut of care of colorectal oncosurgeries. But Let's not forget that we also have these patients coming for diagnostic, therapeutic, and for palliative interventions. And she's touched upon the endoscopic procedures and the challenges which we anesthesiologists face. Not forgetting that they are more sicker patients and the, the environment is quite challenging. And she's touched upon emergencies, mainly because of obstruction. And then that it's just not colorectal surgery. It's, we also are dealing with metastasis and multi-organ involvement. And most of these patients have this common uh, thread running through even in that post-operative care. So with this, I think we would invite questions and we would just uh, have a gross idea about what others are thinking. I'm sure this, this gamut of surgeries are a common place, not only in cancer institutes or cancer centers, but also in major hospitals across the medical spectrum. So we would love that people imbibe these thoughts and come out with their queries which can be addressed. Is Ankita around? Would she be moderating the chat box? Yeah, there is a one question I think in Kiva and a box. You can take that question. Uh, should I read out? Yes, please. I'm not able to see it in my chat, maybe. You can see the Q and A section on the top of the screen. I'm reading out the question. It is a, with the recent change in NACTRT after the Rapido trial, patients are coming for surgery after only four weeks instead of six to eight weeks. So most patients are coming with lower overall counts. Have you seen any change in your management and complications and blood product requirements? So yes, uh, these patients may come earlier, but the, uh, what has been shown is that if we can start off the prehabilitation, even before they undergo NACT, they probably will be better when they come for surgery. We, uh, we of course keep certain targets to manage these patients, like a hemoglobin of at least eight and uh, counts which I mean, the counts really don't matter, but they should not be because of her underlying infection and the platelet count being the minimal for surgery. But then um, we also want to avoid blood transfusion in these patients. So probably in them giving IV iron early on will help.
Uh, Naidita, if I may come in, I think uh, the question is whether we have noticed any change in our blood component therapy management. I think it's time we look at it more clearly. And uh, changes do keep happening in the way people are coming for surgery. And we need to go back and look at it much with a much closer eye. I have another question in the chat box. Uh, have you incorporated IV lignocaine infusions as a routine in your practice? So if you look at the recommendation, which is there for giving IV lignocaine, it is advised that the center which is having, uh, which is giving these routinely should also have intralipid infusions available for them. So I think that is for now deterring us to, the, uh, to using these, um, using lignocaine routinely. Uh, we do, we have used it, I think for a couple of cases for in which the preoperative pain uh, was considerable and uh, we knew that the postoperative pain management would be quite challenging, but no, we haven't yet started using it routinely. Yes, as an institutional practice, we have not been using lignocaine infusion routinely. And I think uh, we should not be just placing our finger on intralipid availability, but yes, that's an important factor to think about. Uh, there's a question again, uh, which, Sorry, uh, I'm yeah. sorry, I missed the question. I, I think it's about role of erectospinae block in abdominal oncosurgery. So um, as per uh, what we discussed right now, erectospinae block would also form a part of the multimodal uh, treatment uh, of analgesia. So if, as we know, thoracic epidural is the gold standard. And erector spinae has not been proven to be superior to thoracic epidural. And I'm not sure whether it's equal. I think it, there, it is still inferior to a thoracic epidural. Of course, where a thoracic epidural is contraindicated, this could be of use because it's more superficial. But um, uh, why, why go erector spinae when you could also put tab block or quadratus lumborum block? I don't think it's, um, I wouldn't say that it is uh, advised or not advised, it's, but it's definitely an option. Uh, I'd just like to come in at this point, Narita, and uh, uh, just try to focus on whether bilateral electrospinal block is what is being queried over here. Because abdominal oncosurgery, having a unilateral block may not be conducive or worth it. I would uh, invite thoughts from anybody else, Madam. Uh, if you would like to chip in. Yes, so what, uh, bilateral retrospinal block. Usually, uh, see, we uh, I also agree with Narita from my own practice. I will prefer the thoracic epidural uh, because maybe I am not that uh, expert in the block, but probably who are regularly using blocks and regularly giving, they may uh, try these blocks because that is also showing a good uh, result, uh, pain management, pain relief for this patient. But uh, uh, for me, um, most of the people, I think uh, epidural is a gold standard still now. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, but I think uh, I somebody pointed stop? out earlier that if you're going to get patients earlier on after the chemotherapy and with uh, compromised coagulation parameters and things like that, we may have to rethink on the strategy. Uh, a follow-up question is about the length of stay in our institution for colonic and rectal surgeries. Okay, uh, so I don't really have any data about it, uh, but um, for since I said 40% of the surgeries are now being done in a minimally invasive uh, manner. So in these cases, I think the length of stay is uh, probably about four to five days. Uh, it all uh, for open surgeries, which are being increasingly done lesser for this, this uh, it would depend on the uh, you know return of bowel function and other things like if there are any complications. I don't have a number. To so uh, we, we agree that the increasingly we are reducing the extent of open surgeries. Uh, okay. That's a little bit of a paradoxical statement, but that's true. We are moving towards the minimally invasive arena. And uh, yes, the length of stay, I think also should tie down with the return to intended oncologic therapy. So basically it's not just staying in the post-op ward, but they would be in the hospital for other aspects. 
but yes minimally invasive surgery does give us that benefit yes that's what narita i also want to ask you one thing the audit is another uh, important uh, component yes. of pedas i yes. think yes yes so yes. do do you do this uh, do you have the audit regular basis in your institution about your iras protocol or management of the colonic surgeries colonic surgeries so um as of now in our hospital we have iras protocols in place only for upper gi surgeries we don't yet, i think it has become more of a uh, you know a, a way of practice rather than following yeah. an iras protocol per se you know ticking those checkpoints if you ask yes. okay yes they do undergo Uh, i mean in whatever way a bit of rehabilitation they we try to correct their anemia we try to do all the components though it's not yet on paper as an iras protocol for colonic colorectal surgeries in our institution we actually uh, actually if if you see all of us including your institution our is every when i think we try to implement the most of the it has protocol yes component in our regular practice in all surgeries whatever possible yes so yes. it is like not that it has protocol we are following but it is our practice now it is so many of the things like fasting protocol everything nobody is now keeping one night fasting every one of us though though i found in my hospital at least the the first case even if we write down the 6 hours solid and 2 hours strictly liquid towards liquid probably is possible but 6 hours fasting is not possible because of logistic reason Mid midnight nobody is giving nobody is. any food so that is also the problem so so most of the components are actually being followed now as a matter of practice every institution is doing that but for iras in colorectal surgery is a, so many people are talking about compliance how many components you are compliant with and how you are doing so need to find your that your institution. we need to be doing a proper audits Yes, so, so that is the. Uh, how, uh, yeah. See, like we do opioid sparing to the extent possible. We try to mobilize them early. We are going minimally invasive. So all these are components of ERAS, isn't it? Yeah. We don't so, put, we we remove. Even, we don't to put an NG, and even That's if we do true. put an NG for some reason, we remove it at the end of the surgery. Catheters are removed within twenty four hours for colon surgeries. Probably a little later for. rectal surgeries all these things are being done actually so there there is a question in the question answer box same question for iras how many components are you able to follow in your setup so what uh, i would say is we try to follow as much as possible from both anesthetic as well as our gi team is also very actively pursuing they they have also understood the importance of optimizing these patients and to correct their uh, anemia and to uh, you know uh, advise incentive spirometry because not only that it helps improve their preoperative it also teaches them to do that in the post operative period you know uh, you give a person a spirometer on the day one of surgery he won't he's not going to be able to do it but if they are trained to do it preoperatively they know how to use it in the post op period and so they can actually they you you often see patients in the both in the icu and in the post op actively doing the three balls and they are, they show me that see i'm able to do this and you know that is one patient encourages the other so all these components we do try to put into place uh, and uh, we are following uh, a lot of it maybe the ones which are not great recommendations like carbohydrate loading uh, those we are not yet following we don't though it's a dream we don't have a proper prehabilitation setup uh, we we want to have it under one roof where we can assess as well as optimize these patients and probably someday also get cpet for more complicated surgeries uh, but we are trying to do our best i would say actually if you do audit then probably you know how much Compliance and how many companies are following all those things. So I think all of us, uh, as a uh, whole, we should take do audit in our own institution. So that can give a good publication also together if we can plan it. <laughs> so any Certainly. one more question, Doctor Indira has asked it. Do you find that thoracic epidural covers the pain arising from the pelvis? Do you cover that with something else? see um i think we use a bit of opioid in our epidurals 
um, so we do use more i mean it's usual for us to use in um, uh, epidural morphine uh, to add to and to reduce the concentration of local anesthetic that is required and this opioid probably helps to manage the uh, surge, uh, the pelvic pain as well of course we also add uh, the regular paracetamol and NSAIDs, and these will be helpful to manage the pain in the post-operative period arising from the pelvis. So, it's a uh, there's an observation. There's an observation, uh, Narita, about uh, counseling of patients for ERAs as readmission rates are higher. Yes, of course. Um, so they should stay close to the city. Yeah, actually, we have a beautiful setup uh, where uh, we we just grab and keep the patients in uh, near our hospital to enable them to, uh, you know, undergo uh, the post-operative part as well as, you know, uh, uh, to um, keep them here for uh, prehabilitation reasons to optimize whatever, suppose they have a bad um, glycemic control, we admit them a few days prior or poor lung condition, and we admit them and keep them near our hospital a few days prior to optimize that. Uh, so we, we do that. And uh, yes, think, uh, this question stems from the fact that because of errors, we are going low on fluids. We are sending them earlier. So to pick them up so that they have any, any early complications are picked up and they come back to the center early. So that I think is uh, uh, an ongoing uh, uh, skepticism in us that errors does give benefits, but also we have to pick up those outliers quickly and give them the benefit of our care. So that is the concept of peri uh, post operative surgical home. So they are sending to the close by area so that they keep an eye on what is happening post operatively. Yeah, what Dr. <laughs> so, Narita was mentioning was about our uh, patients who come from very far off yes. and they are mm -hmm. not very economically able to sustain in, ho uh, in uh, hotels or in uh, rooms nearby. We have a yes. facility in our hospital to hold them, and that makes it easier for us to monitor them. That, of course, does lay a lot of pressure on the administration and things like that. But yes, we are in the right direction. And yes, yeah. we should audit, and we, we we actually are doing it, but we need to fix numbers. But the numbers are not to ensure 100% compliance to ERAs. It is just to see how far we have gone to the ideal situation and what are the benefits we are reaping from it. Yes, ma'am, yeah. uh, you want to sum up now? Uh, two more questions. It takes it. Uh, I think one is: uh, Do you, you use maltodextrin based uh, drinks like Sarji Curb as preoperative orders? If yes, how is your experience? So uh, for colorectal, so the answer for colorectal uh, surgeries is no. We haven't yet started using it for that. We do have it in place as our ERAS protocol for upper GI surgeries, but we are yet to audit that. We have done uh, the cases and we have got the data, but uh, we haven't yet uh, analyzed the results. So we'll let you know when it comes up. Yeah, we actually have used regular basis almost, maltodextrin named carbo load in most of the patient. And unless this is uh, the comp uh, when we do not use like diabetic patient and uh, prolonged gastric emptying time, those patients, otherwise we use almost all patient uh, maltodextrin as a, uh, the operative uh, nutrition, this thing. So, and uh, result the, quite quite good. Actually, we find it's better. Though, again, I, we didn't do any audit till now, but result is quite good that way. Patients feel uh, is good that way. Yes. Okay, so uh, another Anjali, question. Uh, Anjali, I think, has uh, said she has a comment. So, uh, should we Hi, wait for I'm the really sorry. Yeah. Um, uh, I just wanted to say that, uh, you know, all these questions, are stemming from uh, the ERAS guidelines. And uh, I think Narita has done a very wonderful job of giving us uh, the evidence for nearly every statement that she has made in keeping with these guidelines. The only thing is that for each of us, our setups are slightly different. So it all depends upon how we are able to incorporate all of these things in our practice uh, individually. That is why there is a lot of... Um, difference in what we can incorporate and what we can't incorporate. What uh, Nivedya said is, I think, uh, about that, you know, uh, several of our patients may come as a tertiary referral uh, care and they may not be able to be discharged, really. Meaning the ERAS protocols, as uh, Dr. Jotsa said, is more like, you know, you get them away from the hospital environment 
to maybe a mm-hmm. hotel across the street which is not always possible for all of us and one more thing i wanted to say is you know but these uh, facial plane blocks the thing is that you do get um, somatic pain relief but not necessarily visceral pain relief that is why there is i think a little reluctance in moving away from uh, the thoracic epidural or uh, so on and esp is supposed to uh, the drug is supposed to spread towards uh, the canal so maybe uh, it would cover some aspects of the visceral pain that seems to be the logic behind it but i agree that yes. bilateral people who are who are expert really, there yeah bilateral esp is not really something that you would practice in thoracic uh, surgery we are usually doing unilateral surgeries so esp is a good choice over there but otherwise i think either thoracic or you go in for tap uh, supplemented with uh, a pca or something like that that seems to be the key to managing pain over there but i really want to uh, congratulate narita on this uh, wonderful uh, lecture that is what i really wanted to do and for dr arvind and uh, dr jyotsha yeah. for <laughs> guiding thank the you, thank you thank you for chipping in it's 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 quite motivating motivating that we are coming out with uh, good presentations week after week and this is week number 22 so we have a long way to go thank you yeah for, i would just like to say uh, to the people who are attending today uh, i would welcome any suggestions from your side we are nearly half way into the year and if you feel that there are certain aspects that we should discuss please feel free uh, if you wish to send me a direct message please do so thank you yes so it is a actually nice so I, i think you can wrap up now many all the questions are answered now and uh, narita is a wonderful presentation and uh, very well uh, you covered almost everything and as uh, colorectal surgery nowadays actually is like synonymous with eras anything colorectal the people are talking with us all all measures we are taking as i said this is our routine practice now actually so is better to if we all together do audit and do some uh, see what is our practice and how much we are getting good outcome it's not that just length of stay but also the we have to give the patient back to their own original treatment and all those things so that is all more important in cancer patient so uh, it's very good presentation and i'm very happy that today many questions many people are actually act, uh, joined actively and discussed actively it should be like this that they that only give the importance of our webinar right so thank you very much noidita and dr arvin it was nice yeah, thank you so much from chennai and, and thanks yes. to everybody to par- have participated in this thank you thank you so much everyone so thank much. you for sharing your valuable insights and thank you hoping to meet you again on this platform very soon for any next sessions so with all your permissions we are signing off for today thank you yes, thank you, thank you. Thank you.